welcome to AR TV. I'm your host, Morgan Ray. We're lucky to have an incredible lineup on today's show, celebrating the business of the arts. We start off with a dynamic duo, Scotty So and Scarlett. We'll then drop the ball, or balloon really, with Sean O'Kelly, a journalist turned balloon sculpture artist. Next, we take you to the Linden Gallery, continuing the celebration with Melinda Martin. Later in the show, Tony Bovet joins us to tell us about the origins and the power of art. Scotty So is currently exhibiting in the NGV Triennial, the West Space Window and Mars Gallery, and works across media using painting, photography, sculptures, site-responsive installation, videos, and drag performance. Welcome to the show, Scotty. Thank you. Um, so take us back to how you began. You started in Hong Kong and now you're Melbourne based. What was the journey as from an artist's perspective? Well, I first moved here three years ago and um, I didn't have any friends here, no family here. Just So kind of just uh, started it all here from the art school. I um, was here for my final year at uh, for my bachelor degree in fine art. Make some friends, but it was still quite slow just to get to understand what the um, art environment here is. Uh, it took me quite a long time to get to know the different um, artist run spaces in Melbourne. Um, and then had my second years in um, VCA, did my honors in fine art there and got some exhibition show during <laughs> that time, and then had my uh, that year, last year in lockdown here, but that was the year that I got to really work on the things that I really want to make at home, and somehow it ended up at the NGV. Oh, and that's how we discovered you. What has the NGV, the Triennale, what has that experience been like? What has it done for you as an artist? I think from my uh, experience with the NGV Triennial, all the preparation with that, it has been quite uh, unreal, surreal. Um, first of all, that sort of opportunity for someone like me that just moved here and still at a young age in their career, kind of um, unbelievable. And But I consider myself quite lucky with the work I uh, made and what it means to the current situation. Um, and the people at the gallery has been so great to work with and I'm very grateful with that opportunity. But because um, the journey has been over Zoom mostly mm -hmm. until the opening. And so I never actually met the uh, curators and the design team or the, or the installation people that helped me with those work um, until I get to meet them during the opening. And I never had that moment of, wow, I'm at the NGV until like this year. Oh, really? Yeah. What was the process? Can you tell us about like applying and, and all the way through uh, the actual show? So there was never like an application, um, but uh, I was just making my work. I always just make my work for making just because I like making them because uh, I make, it's kind of a fun, process and just like making fun work and so wasn't having a purpose for those work but I was just making them and then posting them on internet uh, on my social media and then sometimes I would buy the ads and just like promote myself a little bit um, but I think one of the curators would have seen the um, exhibition I was in during my honors year at the In Porter Museum of Art. And I was doing a performance and apparently one of the uh, their curators or the staff has came through to see the show and got to know about me. And at the end of, uh, I think around July, I got to like email them and then to like show them the work. And they just sent the, pro did the process of um, uh, inquiring. And so that became the work in the collection. Um, so with that um, mask in the the, uh, the respirator mask at the that is at the triennial, um, you can actually put incense in the mask and burn it, and so that the smoke would come out of the mask. Um, I didn't do it with the ones that 
I have given them, but uh, I did with my trial before. And because like, I really like the work that doesn't give an answer to a certain thing. I really like how objects can be, uh, or even concept, concept can be very ambiguous. And so I like to have the objects to have different function that is not its own original function. And so a respirator that is supposed to filter either virus or tear gas. Mm -hmm. I don't know why tear gas would happen, but I'm not going to say too much of politic things. But you know what I mean. Um, so that sort of uh, having that mask, having that sort of function, then actually releasing like a healthy incense. I think that's there's the irony in it, but also it's just stupid. But still have the beauty, so there's that sincere, sincerity in it. So I really like to make my work with um, lots of effort, but to create something just actually stupid. And now we're going to meet your other half, Scarlett. Yes. Welcome, Scarlett. Thank you for joining us. Can you tell us a bit about how it is to be the art itself? Well, not you be the, being the art is not just about being pretty, but um, of course all art must be beautiful. But um, my way of approaching the art as me is that uh, you know how there are lots of um, muses throughout the art history in either um, Western art or Asian art. And um, within that content, the great artists have always have this great muse or the art became, um, the muse became the art themselves. And so in this case, I am the art of Scotty. Um, in a way that I think my approach to the drag and all the female's body images or representing idea of the female body. Um, I see Scarlett as a, or Scotty see me as a um, objectified sort of image of the female, Asian female um, specifically. And so having me being presenting like this, um, I sort of play around the notion of the um, the male artist objectifying objectifying the muses, um, and also as a man uh, having the perfect ideal female image, but then as a man being that, so it's kind of like a different place on the gender and the different play of um, representation as a man, as a woman, as a queer person. It's fascinating. Um, you're doing quite a bit of exhibitions right now. You have the NGV, you're in the West... West, West Space. You're in the West Space window, and you will be on Mars, in the Mars Gallery. Can you speak to more of what's next for you? Um, so right now I'm showing at the, uh, the West Space window with two panel video to channel video work of me lip syncing to the Elgar cello concerto. So strictly uh, no lyrics, no words, just lip syncing to the sound of the cello. It's quite bizarre and hard to understand, but if you, when you see it in person, it's really like... But um, also I'm doing a show for Mass Gallery in Windsor. Um, it's a grip show that is themed with April Fool. Um, I'm planning, my project is to create a collection of garments of Chan Sams and also the shopping grocery trolley um, using rip off uh, designer brand fabrics. Hmm. Such as what you're Such wearing. Such as what I'm wearing right now, which is a Le Vuitton <laughs> rip off fabric. Well, thank you so much, Scarlett, for joining us, and Scotty as well. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here and hearing about your art. Thank you. Sean O'Kelly turned illness into a joyful new career of 40 years in the celebration industry. He not only designs balloon sculptures and experiences, but also is a key part of training and educating future artists. 
Welcome, Sean. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. So, you started out as a journalist and now you're in balloons. Yes. Can you tell me a little bit about that story? Well, um, I, was a, I was a cadet journalist for several years and then I became ill and my family had a party shop in Glen Huntley called OK Party Supplies. So I went to work for them part time and then I started doing decorations for people they'd come into the shop and ask for decorations to be done and I'd go on site and do them in the house and then uh, the world of balloons exploded. Magazines started to come with different pictures in them and uh, conventions were happening uh, with, from the wholesalers where they'd teach classes and I got the bug mm. and that was oh, 40 years ago and I'm still doing it. Wonderful. <sighs> And you've done quite a bit. We see a little bit, some examples of what you've accomplished and what you've showcased behind us. Yes. Now, I'm really fascinated by these balloon drops. What does that mean? Uh, a balloon drop is a, a net, if you could imagine, a long sausage of a net shaped, uh, and it opens at the bottom and the balloons drop on cue. So it opens up like a overcooked hot dog, it splits open. So you have a string that runs along and you pull the net, and, uh, the string and all the balloons drop on cue, which is great for the end of a show or to anchor a moment. Uh, we've, we've done them on several places. We used to do them for the children's hospital at the uh, concerts they'd have at the convention center and we'd have 20 nets in the ceiling and as, as the closing credits happened, they would drop in different locations around the stage. And, uh, and they were all f nets filled with, uh, say, 100 balloons. So it'd last for about two minutes, which was a great effect, which is normally a, a balloon drop would last, say, 30 seconds at the most. Wow. So very short time, but two, two minutes could feel like... Oh, okay. it's an eternity when you're dropping balloons. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, some of the sculptures, how long do they take to make, and can you talk about the process of making something? Well, the, there's, in the old days, we started off, we'd make a frame with chicken wire around it, and we'd tie all the balloons onto the chicken wire, and they'd make a skin around the um, sculpture, say if it was... Uh, so. A sculpture of a ball which is an easy thing to imagine and all the balloons would be tied and but they'd all have to be precision size so that all so you've got a smooth edge it'd be bumpy but it'd be even around the side now we sort of would start with a a pole sometimes and you'd wrap the balloons in clusters of four and pack them up uh, you we can use what we call a um, a linkable balloon which is, has a tail on uh, two ends, it has a little tail on it, and you daisy chain them along. So you've got all these continuous bubbles and you go in two ways, so you can weave them together and you make a blanket and then you can make a sculpture from there. But usually it takes a bit of engineering skills, design skills, a lot of things are done on paper first, of course. And then um, if the balloons are not the same size, it pushes it out of shape so you have to that's the important part that you have consistent sizing with the balloon so they've all got to be say 10 centimeters in diameter once you start to go larger it sort of distorts and you don't get the right shape we met very spontaneously and two days later you were yeah. dropping off balloons on the prince's bridge for me to do a performance piece that and it was so fascinating to see how much joy these balloons brought people. Can you tell us perhaps a story or an, or an example of how... Well, I can, I can tell you a story about how balloons affect people, mm -hmm. which we're not allowed to do anymore, right? Okay. Now, it was in the old days when we used to release balloons, which is a big no-no now, um, because, you, because if you release a balloon into the atmosphere, it's really littering, mm. and you don't know where it lands, so it's environmentally not the right thing to do. But when we used to do them in the early days, we used to do them for funerals. And if you did it for a child's funeral, it's, uh, it's 
people watch up and the process when everybody's at a funeral, I don't want to talk sadness, but everybody's got their head down. And when you release even one balloon and they all watch it, for a couple of moments, their head's lifted up. So the sadness, the whole body changes because they're looking up and they're looking at. And one particular funeral I did, the grandmother was crying and she said they looked like little sperms returning to heaven because they had tails on them. So, and everybody was crying when I got there because it was a child's funeral. And then when I left, they were going in to have their cup of tea and they were laughing and joking. And so it changed the mood of everybody. I've, I've done decorations in the early days for a, a really nasty looking bikey gang and I delivered the balloons and we're setting up in the backyard and they're having their beers and they're being bikies. And I was a bit nervous, but then the children came out and the children started hitting the balloons. And the parents just went crazy. They said, don't you touch the balloons. They were protecting the balloons. And when I left, they were saying, this is beautiful. And you got some bikie with tats all over him telling you how beautiful the balloons are. It just doesn't make sense. You know, I think this is not right. You know, it's just, yeah. but it, it brings out the child and it brings out joy in a lot of people with balloons. And it's a happy thing to do. Now, can you show us a little bit of your um, skills? I can, no, well, I, got, <laughs> I, got a, I just happen to have a balloon here. Okay. And it's what we call a decoration of one. Okay. So... <laughs> uh, I can suggest you can try this at home. This balloon would normally be much larger, it'd be a 30 centimetre, so you just do it a little bit smaller. You tie the knot, like so, and you pull the, what we call the rim of the balloon off, mm -hmm. so it becomes like a little rubber band. Stretch this neck, and then I push it back in side here, and I twist this a little bit, and if I don't muck it up, and I tie in that bit that I pushed in there, it's gripped by that little, and there we have an apple. Oh my gosh, how <laughs> fun, and no waste. That's amazing. Right, so that, and that becomes, if you pick that up, Oh, uh, <laughs> now you pick it up. Okay. Oh, wow. It's stuck to it's there. Stuck it's to like the table. a suction cap. Amazing. So that's just a little trick. And, and what we would do, I often do, and you just put a little flower in there, and it's... Oh, wonderful. So that's just a trick of one balloon. Sean, can you tell us about the largest event you've done? Uh, I can tell you about the largest event I've been part of. In 2016, I was invited with 45 other balloon professionals from around the world to go to China, Xiamen in China. And we went to the balloon festival where we uh, successfully, uh, uh, for the Guinness Book of Records, we made a uh, Chinese palace using 365,000 balloons. And to make the Guinness Book of Records, they all had to be joined as one sculpture. So we made walls, we made uh, a Chinese market, we made uh, a temple, there was a school, there was an exercise yard. There was, uh, it was a phenomenal thing to do. It took us five days to make it, working from close to about eight o'clock in the morning till about eight or nine at night for the five days. And 250,000 people went through to have a look at it and uh, then they returned the, the year later and made a um, China, uh, they made a world zoo out of balloons and they used 450,000 balloons so if it takes two or three days you know to get a big job done for here when we do a decoration maybe two days if you could imagine the logistics of doing 365,000 balloons and making sure that they, they had enough balloons there, the right colours, 
and everybody knew what they were doing. That was just a phenomenal job to be part of, which was a big experience, that's for sure. Great, maybe I'll get a sculpture of myself someday. <laughs> no problem, we, we can use the red balloons for your hair. Wonderful, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us, Thank Sean. you very much. Melinda Martin has been director of the Linden Gallery for the past 10 years. The gallery itself recently celebrated 30 years of the Linden Postcard Show, which showcases 1,000 mini masterpieces of artists in all stages of their career. Welcome, Melinda. Thanks for having me. Well, we are sitting in Troy Emery's Sonder exhibition. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what this is about? So Troy is a Melbourne-based artist um, and his work explores that kind of really interesting space between craft, fashion and contemporary art. He really likes to blur the boundaries. So what I love about this work is that they are kind of creatures but you can't actually work out what they are. And what he deliberately does is kind of hide the face of these creatures so you can't actually see into eyes, you can't kind of use that um, approach that we often do with animals and kind of make them human. It's kind of denied by his practice, which I think is really interesting, but he's also interested in that really amazing kind of, um, kind of interesting way that the tassel is used. So often the tassel is used to fringe like curtains or um, upholstery or, you know, fabulous frocks in ballroom dancing and things like that. And here he's playing around with this kind of thing that you, you want to touch, but in reality and in a public gallery, you're not allowed to touch. Um, so he's really playing around with those kind of ideas. And even the word sonder is really interesting. So it's a word that's only come into use in the last couple of years. And it really is about this idea that we all have this internal world and yet we don't really know what's going on in your internal world and what's going on in my internal world. We might actually be having the same inner thoughts, but we never really know. And I think when we think about the animal world, do animals have those same inner thoughts that we as humans have? So he's really interested in that kind of idea of how we communicate what we think and what we project out into the world, I think. I'd love to know a little bit about your journey within the gallery in the past decade. So it's been a really interesting journey. Um, I think in the last sort of 10 years, we've really spent some time really thinking about what the focus of the gallery should be. So unlike many other public galleries around Australia, we don't have a collection. So we really thought about where were the gaps in the market in terms of contemporary galleries? How could we connect to the community? And what kind of, because the community has changed quite a lot around us in those 10 years as well. And what kind of programming could we do? So we've spent a lot of time really refining that. We focus on the work of mid-career artists. So those artists, and that's often a really critical point in career development because they, there's lots of emerging artists who emerge out of art school predominantly, and then there's less established artists. And at this point, often people decide whether to go or to stay. So we really spend a lot of time working with artists. In terms of the preparation for artists that we show, there's often a year to two years in the making of one exhibition. So we spend a lot of time working with artists, talking about ideas, and then creating a range of programs to support the exhibitions. And how do you find these artists that are at a pivotal point in their life? We do a lot of stalking. <laughs> <laughs> no, we actually spend a lot of time doing some research, but there's a whole range of things that we, it's not just the career stage that we look at, we look at it through a gender lens. Have we got enough balance between artists who are male and female? Have we got enough balance in our overall program? And we look at that in sort of a three to five year kind of program. Have we shown photography? Have we shown installation? Have we shown video art, painting? And really thinking about that, but also looking at what's happening out in the world. What is the conversation? What are people talking about? What is happening with the politics of the day? You know, lots of artists are exploring ideas about um, climate change, for example. So for us to ignore that whole aspect would be a, a real um, kind of denial of the conversations that are occurring. So we spend a lot of time really looking at that overall balance in the program so that we're presenting a diversity of contemporary art for visitors to enjoy. So you find these artists, you exhibit their works. What happens after a show is done? So we spend a lot of, we, we still stay in touch with artists. You know, there are artists, um, recently one of the artists that we showed probably about four or five years ago, she's just had a show opened at Bayside Gallery. 
And that came from her in a real pivotal time in her career. She um, went and did a residency overseas in the Amazon and from that created this new body of work. And we've kept in touch through that process. You know, at the time she was, she was a mum who had kids still at school, so she couldn't really do a residency until they were much older. And that enabled her to do that. And that has created this new body of work and I'll have a studio visit with her on Friday. So we keep in contact with our um, alumni artists. It, you know, in many ways, they often will ring us for some advice about a particular thing. They might be working on a particular project or they want to show this work outside of Victoria. What other galleries do they think that they should go to? And we'll have those conversations. Sometimes we make introductions to things. Um, sometimes it might be an issue that is coming up in the, in the business side of their practice, like a copyright infringement or another complex issue where they might ring us and say, who do you know? And then we'll actually go, here are the other three people you should talk to to help them on their journey. So sometimes we don't have the answers, but we'll have a network of people who can help and support them. Well, so really, when you become part of the Linden Gallery, you're part of the family. You are, That's whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> We've probably got the crazy uncle as part of the mix as well. So oh, yeah. <laughs> Don't we all? Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today, Melinda. It's a pleasure, Morgan. The word art originates from the Latin meaning for skill or craft, and the Indo-European meaning to arrange. Art was most likely created as an outlet of expression. It enabled us to use our individual perception to interpret it, whilst it still communicated a message, be it spiritual, philosophical, religious or political. The earliest art was most likely from indigenous cultures such as the Aboriginals, who depicted their culture and spirit dreamings through cave drawings and painting. Art later derived from ancient civilizations such as Africa, China, pre-Columbia, Egypt, Greece, India, Mesopotamia, Oceania and Rome. Ancients saw their gods as their main source of artistic devotion. It was expected of them to depict them as superhumans portrayed with their special powers. Ancient cultures like Greece concentrated more on animals before moving on to capture the human form. By the time of the Middle Ages, Gothic and Byzantine art was influenced by religious beliefs. During the Romantic period, art was considered more of a mental exercise associated with science and religion. It has been developed into many styles, such as Arabesque, Baroque, Bauhaus, Byzantine, Carolingian, Christian, Classicism, Gothic, Indigenous, Islamic, Naturalism, Realism, Rococo, Romanticism and Surrealism. When aesthetic beauty was created with a purpose of particular function, such art became known as more of a craft rather than just an art form. Early pottery and wicker basket weaving is a great example of such crafts being established. Art has also allowed us to discover each other's cultures and beliefs, from the different languages we all speak, to the cultural wardrobes we all wear. Art is simply a huge part of our lives. Without it, we would not have any architecture, carving, ceramics, commercial art, crafts, dance, design, drama, drawing, engraving, fashion, film, fine art and graphic art, language, literature, lithography, music, opera, painting, performing arts, photography, poetry, sculpture, theatre, visual arts and writing. Art allows us to think as independently as we like whilst remaining open to a variety of interpretations. We can look up to the skies and interpret the stars and clouds above as art. Even a sunset allows us to be enriched by Mother Nature's daily ability to offer us escapism. Art provides a truly universal platform for the unique actions of just one artist to effectively enrich the lives of so many. What an ultimate gift to appreciate in this modern day world. Tony, thank you so much for sharing the origins of art. It was fascinating and you had so much content to go over. I thoroughly enjoyed researching that topic. I did it quite a while ago, so it was a real pleasure to actually um, to present that, yeah, share the knowledge. Now, I found Scotty and the transformation to Scarlet was so enlightening and also that the NGV found him through Instagram. 
Amazing, brilliant, uh, really interesting. I want to know more about the balloons. Oh, balloons, they bring <laughs> people so much joy. Uh, Sean taught us how much goes into the production of doing a drop. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, amazing. That's about it for this week. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email at ideas at studioemedia.com.au. See you next time.